Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Desert Grady and today we're going to be discussing the top five high impact ways FBRM and PVM can improve laboratory crystallization. As a brief overview of what we're going to look at today, I'm going to start with this slide. So firstly, we're going to look at how our FBRM and PVM typically used in laboratory crystallization. Next, we're going to figure out where do FBRM and PVM fit into a typical crystallization workflow. And then we're actually going to move on to five case studies themselves based around the top five uses that we see in industry for the use of FBRM and PVM. So these are uh, reducing fines generation to improve filtration, identifying crystallization problems at a small scale, optimizing seeding protocol, targeting an appropriate endpoint during wet milling, and finally identifying and monitoring a polymorph transformation. And then finally to wrap up at the end of the webinar, uh, we're just going to look quickly at a couple of industrial examples uh, and then also I have a reference list as well. So you'll notice uh, an asterisk beside the, the polymorph transformation bullet and I just want to point out that FBRM and PVM, as I'm going to discuss in more detail, uh, can identify and track shape changes or habit shifts, but it's always useful or always vital to use another method such as DSC or TGA to categorically confirm polymorph, the presence of a polymorph and also the conversion. So we're going to start with how are FBRM and PVM typically used in laboratory crystallization. So I asked a lot of people I work with in industry what they use FBRM and PVM for, and here are some of the typical answers. So one of the, the, the simplest ones was to see what's going on in the crystallization. Another one was to decide how long uh, crystallization hold times should be. To see if the process was, was repeatable is another. Um, one of them was trying to modify or improve the aspect ratio to improve flowability. So I asked this question to a lot of people and we got a lot of different answers. So there was a lot of kind of responses. So to see if there's growth or nucleation, seeding studies, batch comparison for scale up and tech transfer, scale down to try and solve plant problems. We use it to monitor wet milling. That was a big one. Figuring out the appropriate cooling rate. Uh, identifying issues at small scale like oiling out and eliminating fines for better filtration. And I kind of grouped all these responses to try and get an, uh, an overall idea of what FBRM and PVM is really used for, so it kind of could kind of be categorized. And it kind of worked out a little bit like this. So the first uh, uh, section is really process understanding, understanding what's happening in the process. The next was trying to establish a design space, so what cooling rate should I use, what's the appropriate sea temperature, for example. Risk management um, is where these kind of fit in, so to see if the process is repeatable, to see how scalable the process is, and to identify process upsets. And then finally, process improvement, which is maybe more um, prevalent in a tech, op lab, tech ops lab, um, for example. So moving on to our next uh, topic. Where do FBRM and PVM fit into the crystallization workflow? And the question I'm really trying to answer is here is, is what do FBRM and PVM do in a crystallization process? So in a typical crystallization workflow, you have input properties. For example, the concentration, the solvent type, uh, whether the process is seeded or unseeded, the scale of the process, um, the temperature and the impurity profile. There's a lot more uh, input properties. That, a lot of the time these are set kind of by the chemistry um, and there's a lot more to them but these are just kind of an example. Combined with the input properties there are the process parameters that you can choose. So for example agitation, cooling rate, uh, hold times, seeding protocol, anti-solvent addition, and maybe temperature cycle. And when you combine these two together you get some sort of transformation in the crystallization. So when you set everything up and you pick your cooling rate and your agitation, for example, you proceed with the crystallization, you're going to get transformation. The crystals are going to change or transform. And these transformation processes include nucleation, primary and secondary, uh, crystal growth. You might get phase separation or oiling out. You might get form conversion, uh, habit shift, for example. Uh, you might get attrition and you might get agglomeration. And there's more to it as well, but these are kind of a 
maybe the most common ones are some simple ones. And then after this transformation, basically what you're trying to do is to target a specific product performance. So for example, the particle size spec, the purity, the yield, a dissolution rate uh, in a tablet, for example, and also process performance. So for example, filtrability, formulability, um, repeatability, robustness, cycle times, for example, uh, are all important to the process. So the whole idea is that you uh, want to change your input properties and your process parameters to get the correct transformation occurring, so the great balance, the, the correct balance of nucleation and growth, for example. And then once you do this, you can target the crystals to behave appropriately to get the best product and the best performance. So where exactly does FBRM fit in? This is really where FBRM and PVM fit in. So FBRM and PVM reveal how changing the input properties and the process parameter parameters impact key crystallization mechanisms. And then if we look at the second part, FBRM and PVM can be used to target a specific particle distribution to optimize product and process performance. So in all the examples I'm going to look at today, uh, we're going to take this slide and we're going to point out what are the input properties that we're changing, what are the process parameters we're changing, how does this impact the transformation, and then what's the downstream result for the product and the process. So let's move on to our first uh, top five use. These are in no particular order. Uh, reduce fines generation to improve filtration. So like I said, I'm going to focus uh, on this slide. And what we're looking at here is an example where we change the cooling rate, keeping everything else constant. Uh, this impacts the nucleation rate. And the nucleation rate subsequently impacts the filtrability. So we're going to look at this process and how exactly does FBRM and PVM give you uh, the information that ultimately um, improves in a, in a more filtrable process. So this is a cooling crystallization at a one liter scale. Agitation is set at 400 RPM, and this is a saturated solution at 80 degrees C. A lot of the examples I'm going to talk about today are actually from um, the pharmaceutical industry, so we can't go into a whole lot of detail uh, about what they are, but we can show the trends and give some background, some small amount of background information. So if we look at this FBRM trend, on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis, we've got two scales. The first is the fine counts measured by the FBRM. In other words, the fines in the process. And then the other one is temperature. So we can see the temperature uh, is a slow cooling rate at first over the first 20 hours. And then the cooling rate is increased over the final four hours. And we can see right at the point where the cooling rate is increased, we can see an increase in the fines generation rate. So an increase in the cooling rate results in an increase in fines generation for this process. So what have we learned from this? So firstly, FBRM immediately indicates that the second cooling ramp results in increased fines generation, like I said, and this is process understanding. Secondly, the shorter batch time that we achieve by cooling faster for the final four hours needs to be balanced against a potentially longer filtration and drying time. So if we have more fines in the process, a wider particle distribution, filtration times could be longer and drying times could be longer as well. Thirdly, the particle distribution can be engineered so as to ensure the most effective crystallization process. So we can change the cooling rate to generate the appropriate particle distribution that gives us the best filtration time and batch time. So these three things we can see, firstly, process understanding, secondly, risk management, because we know that we need to balance um, the cooling rate to achieve uh, a longer filtration time, but potentially a shorter batch time. And then finally, process improvement and design space. We've covered the kind of four key concepts that we're looking at um, from the, the one of the first slides we looked at. So now, how do we link this information to the downstream process? So what we can do is we can take distributions from this trend at key points. So we can see we've taken one just before, just at the end of the first cooling ramp, and then also at the end of the second cooling ramp. And we can clearly see a difference in the distrib particle distribution, the cord length distribution measured by the FBRM at these two points, the significantly more fines generated after the second cooling ramp. 
So the FBRM provides quantitative information at different key process time points, and these are revealed by the particle distribution. So what other information can we get? Well, with the PVM, we can get uh, images, images. So we can see that once we start that cooling rate, we get significantly more fine material coming into the process. You can see at the start we have well-formed uh, crystals, but then when we increase that cooling rate at the end, we can see we get fines generation, uh, a lot of fine particles in there too. So the PVM really helps understand the FBRM data. And the other thing we can do is we can actually put numbers or statistics, or we can take numbers and statistics from that distribution. So the, the idea here, um, what I'm going to look at is, imagine if we isolated at point A and point B. So point A being the end of the first cooling step and point B being the end of the second cooling step. So we can see the different statistics that the FBRM provides. Firstly, the fine count, the number of fines in the process. At isolation point A is about 8,000, whereas at isolation point B it's about 13,000. So a significant increase um, in the number of fines between the two isolation points if we, cho if we chose them. Second, we can look at the median. So the median particle dimension. So at the first isolation point it's 13 microns and the second isolation point it's 10 microns, or just under 10 microns. So what does this mean for the, the filtration? So we can see the filtration time, should we isolate a point A, is 2.5 hours, but should we isolate a point B, it's 4.2 hours. So the significant change in filtration time there due to the increased fine counts, and that increased fine counts we know from the FBRM is due to that change in the cooling rate. And I just want to point out here as well, obviously there's going to be a significant yield difference between these two points because we haven't reached saturation or we haven't uh, cooled further all the way to, down the solubility curve. So isolation point A, the yield is 82%. Isolation point B, it's 96%. So all these things have to be balanced. But really the point I'm trying to show here is that a, a target particle distribution um, can be achieved by changing your input properties, your process parameters, that gives you the best downstream process, in this case the filtration rate. So now we'll move on to the next example. So identifying crystallization problems at the small scale. So again, we'll, so again, we'll move back to this slide. So we're looking at the agitation rate as one of the key process parameters. We're going to look at its impact on phase separation, as we'll learn is the case, and how this impacts purity, scalability, and robustness. So here's the FBRM trend in this case. This is an anti-solvent addition crystallization at the 100 mL scale. And for the first experiment we're going to look at, the agitation is at 100 RPM. And this is a saturated solution at 30 degrees C, constant temperature for the duration of the batch. We can see on the FBRM trend, we can see the volume of anti-solvent added at a specific rate. And if we look at the FBRM trends, the first thing that we see is the red curve which is the fine count, we see a rapid increase in the fine count followed by an equally rapid decrease in the fine count. And then there's a subsequent or later increase in the coarse count. So it appears that there's a rapid generation of very fine particles followed by the disappearance of those and then an increase in the number of large particles. So the question is, what's the, the, the question is what is the crystallization mechanism? So for me, looking at this FBRM data, I might think it's rapid nucleation, that rapid increase in the fine count, followed by uh, rapid agglomeration, which is the rapid decrease in the fine count and an increase in the coarse count, so those small particles sticking together to form large ones. Um, but that turned out not to be the case, as we're going to learn from the PVM images that we'll show. So if we look at a PVM image at 14 minutes, at that point on the trend that I've highlighted, we can see, in fact, uh, oil droplets. So in this case, the anti-solvent addition resulted in phase separation or an oil phase forming. And that was why we saw this really rapid increase in the fine count. It was due to that rapid formation of, an oil, of oil droplets and an oil phase. 
if we look at the FBRM distribution at this point as well, we can see it's a tight particle distribution centered around 40 microns. And we can see that correlates well with the PVM images. So typically when we see a very nice tight um, distribution like that, it can sometimes be a flag that indicates you have oiling out, but the PVM obviously um, instantly shows what's going on. Now if we look at a second time point, after 15 minutes, about a minute and a half or two minutes later, we can see now from the PVM image clearly what's going on. We can see that the number of oil droplets we see is decreasing and we're also beginning to see crystals form. This correlates well again with the FBRM data. We can see a decrease in that uh, peak around 40 microns or that distribution around 40 microns and that's the oil phase disappearing and we can see an increase above 100 microns which is the formation of those crystals. So disappearance of the droplets here and the formation of the large crystals. Now if we move on, now if we move on to the end of the crystallization, after about 25 minutes, we can see all we're left with is large crystals. There's no oil phase present. And we can see on the FBRM distribution now that oil phase is completely gone, completely dissipate, dissipated, and we've just got significant crystal growth of those crystals have grown extremely rapidly. One other thing we see from the PVM image, it looks like there's significant agglomeration um, in this process as well, as well probably just due, due to that high supersaturation that's obviously present that causes the oiling out as well. So what have we learned from this uh, first experiment, which was conducted at 100 RPM? So PVM immediately identifies the mechanism, in this case is phase separation or oiling out, followed by rapid nucleation and growth. And this is obviously a very important process understanding. At a very early stage in development, this is at 100 mil scale, um, scalability, robustness and purity are identified as potential issues that are going to have to be addressed as you scale up. That oiling out phase of the propensity of this system to oil out is going to, is going to have to be addressed uh, in order to scale up effectively. Um, more process understanding. So the, the possible mechanism here, the reason we're getting oiling out is that we're getting poor anti-solvent incorporation, which is resulting in locally high supersaturation close to, close to the feed location. Um, so potentially what's happening is that we're adding anti-solvent uh, quickly, we're not stirring fast enough, and we're getting a locally high supersaturation at the feed point, which results in this oiling out phenomenon. Finally, the design space. Uh, based on this information, we know that the agitation intensity as well as the addition rate are going to be critical control parameters. They're going to help, help uh, to minimize or eliminate this oiling out um, event. And that's exactly what we're going to show in the next couple of slides. So here, we're going to repeat the exact same experiment, except this time the agitation is 200 RPM. So this is the trend we get at 200 RPM. We can see it's very, very different. So firstly, we see we don't see that rapid increase in the fine count, uh, followed by that rapid decrease, which indicates there's no phase separation or no oiling out. What we do see is just a rapid increase in the coarse count, which indicates ex extremely fast growth, and it reaches steady state very quickly. And if we take an image at that point, at the point where we saw oiling out before, we can see we have simply crystals, nice, long, well-formed crystals, less agglomeration in this case as well. But what we also see here, this isn't a, an oil droplet, it's actually a bubble. So when we increase the agitation rate from 100 to 200 RPM at this 100 mil scale, we get bubbles coming into the system. And this is something maybe that needs to be uh, addressed as well, maybe change the impeller to eliminate those bubbles, but still ensure uh, adequate mixing, or maybe it doesn't need to be addressed. So what have we learned? So in terms of establishing the design space, increasing the agitation from 100 RPM to 200 RPM while maintaining other parameters constant eliminates this oiling out event. Increased agitation obviously facilitates anti-solvent incorporation and reduces that locally high supersaturation that was observed. 
and then find you the design space again. FBRM and PVM could also be used to see how other variables apart from the agitation, like seeding, which is very useful for eliminating going out, the addition rate and scale influence the process. So here again, we've covered design space and understanding in, in a, a, a very simple experiment, two simple experiments we've, we've gathered a lot of information about this process and how we need to proceed to, to develop it and scale it up properly. So now to our third example, which is optimizing the seeding protocol. So here in this example, what we're going to look at is how seeding protocol is going to impact our nucleation rate, uh, primary and secondary, as well as our growth rate. And then how does that impact our particle size spec and then also the cycle time of the process. So in these experiments, a saturated solution is cooled inside the metastable zone and seed is added. Three experiments are performed at differing seeding temperatures. And it looks uh, a little bit like this. So basically you can see the solubility curve here um, in blue. You can see the metastable zone width, uh, which we've measured previously in red. And then you can see our three seeding temperatures. So a high seeding temperature at 33 degrees, uh, a medium seeding temperature at 27 degrees, and a low seeding temperature at 19 degrees. And essentially what these are, it's, a, it's an isothermal desupersaturation experiment. So seed is added, the same quantity of seed, in this case 0.2, five grams of seed is added at each point and it's just allowed to desupersaturate. So we're not cooling or adding, adding any anti-solvent or anything. We just want to have a look at the crystallization kinetics uh, and how the, they are impacted or influenced by the seeding temperature. So to do that, we use FBRM to monitor the growth and nucleation. And we use PVM, or we can use PVM um, to study seed behavior. In this um, uh, webinar, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the PVM side, I'm really going to focus on the FBRM side. So here are the results from our three experiments. So you can see our three different seeding temperatures. We have three trends overlaid for each one. Uh, on the x-axis here is time, as usual, and on the y-axis is the counts per second between 1 and 10 microns. So what we're really looking at is new counts between 1 and 10 microns, so the small counts in the system. And it's clear to see that the rate of increase of those small counts uh, is very rapid at 19 degrees. So when we have a low seeding temperature, that increase is very rapid. And essentially what we're looking at here is it, what could be described as a, a relative nucleation rate. I don't want to use the word actual nucleation rate because we need to know things like the, the volume or the, the number of crystals been born per unit volume. But essentially what this is, is some sort of relative nucleation rate that the FBRM can measure uh, very easily. So we can see at 19 degrees, this relative nucleation rate is fast. At 27 degrees, you can see it's somewhere in the middle. And at 33 degrees, you can see it's quite slow. The other thing we see is the batch time. So how long does it take for the material to desupersaturate or reach steady state for all the crystals to grow or nucleate out. So we can see at the, the low seeding temperature, 19 degrees, uh, everything's complete after about 60 minutes. At uh, 27 degrees, everything's complete uh, at about 90 minutes. And at 33 degrees, it takes a lot longer, so over uh, two hours. And the reason for this is pretty clear as well, is, is that at the low seeding temperature, the supersaturation uh, is, is high. Um, basically, the driving force is there to make the crystallization quick. It's kind of rapid crystallization. Whereas at 33 degrees, the, the supersaturation is low, and that driving force isn't there, and it takes longer. So what have we learned? So in terms of process understanding, essentially what I've just said. So at low seeding temperature, the relative nucleation rate is high or very fast. Um, and at low seeding temperature, the batch time is much shorter. So these are two very important things because the nucleation rate is going to impact your particle size spec. And also the batch time is going to obviously impact uh, cycle time. So these are, are good things to know at, the early, at an early stage in the process especially when you're trying to um, design it. 
So in this graph, what we're looking at is, uh, again, on the x-axis time, but in this case, the y-axis is different. The y-axis is counts per second between 100 and 1,000 microns. So really what we're looking at here is the number of large crystals coming into the system. And what this is really is, is a relative growth rate. So it's kind of we're looking at a different size range. We're really looking at how those crystals are growing into large size ranges, and we're looking at the rate of that. So here we see the trends are actually switched around. So at the... Uh, at the, the, the low seeding temperature, you can see the growth rate is actually slow. At the medium uh, seeding temperature, it's somewhere in the middle, and the growth rate is the highest at the, the highest seeding temperature. And again, this makes sense because it's it's down to the supersaturation. Uh, when you keep the supersaturation low, you tend to favor growth over nucleation. And when the supersaturation is high as it is at the low seeding temperature, you tend to favor nucleation over growth. So this is kind of confirming classic crystallization theory, but we're kind of quantifying exactly what's happening. So again, just to kind of summarize at high seeding temperature, the relative growth rate is faster. So here we're going to look at um, some FBRM particle distributions, the chord length distribution for our the endpoint of each experiment. And what we can see is that clearly, at the as you increase seeding temperature, you can see the particles are much larger in dimension. So at 19 degrees C, we get the smallest mean particle dimension, 53 microns in this case. At 27 degrees in medium seeding temperature, it increases up to 77. And at the high seeding temperature, you can see it's up to 85. And that makes sense based on the nucleation and growth rates that we've just seen. At the highest seeding temperature, the growth rate was high, the nucleation rate was low, and we do end up with the largest uh, particle dimension here. So for this system, just to summarize again, a lower seeding temperature results in a larger particle dimension. Sorry, uh, I should say a higher seeding temperature results in a larger particle dimension. So we can actually quantify these differences. And this is kind of like uh, maybe establishing a design space where we can actually target uh, batch time as well as maybe a mean dimension based on seeding temperature. And maybe you introduce further variables here and do some more complex analysis. Um, you can introduce stuff like a further cooling rate after the seed, the, the seed loading, all these kind of things, and you establish a much larger design space than this, but this is a very simple uh, way of looking at it. And essentially what we're looking at is just the relationship between the seeding temperature at the batch time and the final mean dimension of the particles measured by the FBRM. So clearly the impact of seeding temperature and particle dimension uh, can be quantified, and very quickly as well in three experiments uh, we get this information out. In terms of risk management, the seeding temperature will obviously be a critical variable to control during the scale-up because when you change the seeding temperature, you change the, the, the growth and nucleation rates, and that's going to be very important for control. So you really want to keep a strict uh, control on the seeding temperature. So now we're going to move on to our fourth example, which is targeting uh, an endpoint during wet milling. So this is the setup that we're, we're looking at. You can see the process parameters that we are going to, to be able to change or to look at are the agitation, in this case, the, the wet mill, um, like the mill speed, for example, uh, the whole time, how long do we mill for? And then the transformation is obviously breakage or attrition. And then this impacts our particle size spec because we want to target a specific size reduction. Also the cycle time uh, in terms of targeting the endpoint and also the formulability of the API that we sent to the formulators. So here's the FBRM trend. And what we're looking at here in red is the fine counts between 10 and 40 microns. And also we're looking at the mean dimension. So we can see this is classic uh, breakage process. So we can see at the point where we start the mill, we get a decrease in the mean dimension over time. And we get an increase in the fine count. So those large crystals we have at the start are simply breaking apart, the mean dimension is decreasing, and the number of counts that we get is increasing. And again, this is a crystal slurry 500 mil scale ambient temperature, and it's just a homogenizer or a wet mill that's breaking these crystals apart. So from this simple trend, FBRM clearly, clearly monitors the wet milling step and allows the breakage kinetics to be estimated. So we can see how quickly um, 
these these particles or crystals are breaking apart. And if we change something like the mill speed, we can see how that impacts the breakage kinetics. If we increase the mill speed, do we get faster breakage? In terms of the design space, like I said, the impact of process parameters like the mill speed, but also concentration, residence time, temperature even, can be studied to target a specific particle endpoint. And then FBRM can be implemented at all scales, allowing a repeatable endpoint to be targeted in a small number of batches. So this is a very useful application for FBRM that's widely used, where um, the wet milling parameters are studied at the smaller scale, and then they use FBRM at the uh, pilot scale and, and the actual full manufacturing scale to make sure they're getting a repeatable uh, wet milling process that's targeting the appropriate particle size or particle distribution. So just like before, we're going to look at some PVM images. So here we can see the PVM image at the start. You can see you have uh, nice, well-formed crystals, aspect ratio of a prob uh, approximately 5 to 1. Often the wet milling step is done um, in the case where you want to reduce the aspect ratio, because often long needles don't flow well, they don't formulate very well uh, either. So the wet milling step is there to break them apart and to decrease the aspect ratio. And if we look at the endpoint, we can see the PVM image again. We can see those crystals have been broken apart. And the aspect ratio is significantly reduced, probably 2 to 1 now. However, the one thing that's clear to see in this PVM image is there's a number of really, really small uh, particles, probably between 1 and 10 microns, that look different to the crystals themselves. And what looks like is happening, as well as the breakage event, the breakage of those crystals in half, for example, we're also getting significant attrition. And these are the attritive particles or crystals that we're seeing. So we need to re-examine our FBRM data to try and see if we can track this attrition process as well. So if we go back, we can see now we have this pink um, trend in there also. And this is really the counts per second less than 10 microns. So the really, really small stuff that we picked up when we looked at the PVM images. And we can see when we turn that mill on, as well as getting this kind of nice breakage kinetics where the breakage is fast at first and then slow towards the end, we can see we're also getting this linear increase in very fine or small particle count. And this is due to the attrition. So what information does this give us? So again, this is process understanding. So the PVM images combined with the FBRM data show that breakage and attrition are the key mechanisms. In terms of risk management, early in development, uh, attrition is identified as a potential process issue, and this could impact scale-up, tech transfer, filtration, or formulation. So definitely the attrition is something that perhaps we need to eliminate, or at least want to be able to track and control repeatedly. And then finally, the design space. Potentially we can change the mill, or adjust the mill speed, or adjust other process parameters to eliminate or reduce this unwanted attrition effect. So the final example we're going to look at is identifying and monitoring polymorph transformation. And again, I should just give the caveat uh, down here that FBRM and PVM can identify and track shape changes or habit shifts, but always we don't look at the molecular structure. So always another method needs to be used to confirm um, what the FBRM or the PVM might raise as a flag for polymorph transformation. Once this is established, it becomes very simple to track uh, with the FBRM and the PVM, but always DSE or TGA or some other technique should be used. So here we're looking at a few different variables. So we're looking at how temperature, hold time, and the seeding protocol uh, impact a form conversion or a habit shift as we actually track using the FBRM and the PVM, uh, and how this impacts the purity or the polymorphic form. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this uh, in the interest of time, so it's going to be maybe a little bit more of a cursory glance. And please feel free to contact us if you'd like more uh, information. So in this experiment, um, we use metastable seeds are added to a supersaturated solution. Uh, the temperature is set at 45 degrees C and held there. The agitation is 250 RPM. So essentially what you can see here is some, uh, an FBRM trend with a few different statistics. Now this is kind of difficult to um, interpret off the bat, but I think with the PVM images it's going to be very clear 
what exactly is going on. We can see there at around 25 minutes there's a, a significant decrease in the number of fine counts, an increase in the median, and um, kind of over time there's been a decrease in the very large counts as well. So with the PVM I think we're really going to be able to see uh, exactly what is going on there and then help interpret that FBRM data. So. So here's the first uh, PVM image right at the start of the batch and what we can see is that we have uh, needle shaped crystals. So those uh, needle shaped crystals, it's a high concentration, densely concentrated slurry of uh, needle shaped crystals and these are the uh, metastable, uh, this is the metastable form of this polymorph. And we can also see obviously the FBRM distribution as well there which corresponds to that picture. Now if we jump ahead to that point that I described in about 25 minutes where we see to see that uh, significant shift in the FBRM trends, we can see clearly what's going on. So we can see that those needles are disappearing and dissolving and we are forming more kind of block shaped um, crystals. So this is the polymorph transformation in action. Again, you always want to check to make sure um, that it is a polymorph transformation. In this case, I think it's pretty clear but you always want to check with your offline method like DSC or TGA. And what we can see on the FBRM distribution on the right hand side there is that the distribution is beginning to get much narrower and tighter. And that makes sense if you think about the way the FBRM measures. When you have just needles, you tend to measure a lot of the needle widths. So a lot of small counts or fine counts. You also measure the needle lengths. So you're measuring a lot of large counts. As you move towards the blocks, you're really just measuring medium size um, counts and that's why that distribution gets much tighter. So 25 minutes the transformation uh, begins. And then if we go right to the end we can see that we just have the stable form of the crystals present. So just those blocks are left and we actually see a little bit of agglomeration there. And then also on the FBRM distribution we can see it's even tighter and narrower now as we lose those large counts from that we were measuring uh, as a result of the needle length and those fine counts as a result of the needle width. Now we're just measuring uh, those blocks. So to summarize, so to summarize what we've what we've learned. So PVM images provide instant process understanding and visualize the polymorph transformation. In this case, this was a deliberate attempt. It's a form conversion, and that was the experiment. But a lot of the time, what PVM can do early in development is identify that conversion um, when it was unexpected. So to kind of see a new polymorph uh, appearing or, or a metastable form disappearing if there's a difference in shape between the two. Um, crystals and if it's significant like that. So that's really what the PVM can do, it, it really can see what's going on inside the process. In terms of the design space, the FBRM trend tracks the transformation process and identifies the whole time necessary to ensure completion. So once we establish that this is the polymorph transformation, you can see that after maybe 30 minutes, maybe it's not quite finished. Um, maybe after 50 minutes it's more complete, we can take one sample, we can do our offline analysis, confirm that we just have one polymorph um, and know that it's done, as opposed to taking five or six samples at different time points waiting for that transformation to be complete. And then finally, the transformation rate kinetics, which we're measuring here on this FBRAM trend, could be calculated or investigated for various process conditions. So how does the temperature, um, the concentration, agitation, all those different variables, the seed loading, uh, all that kind of thing, how does that influence our transformation rate and also the extent of the transformation, which is very important information. So finally, we'll just move on uh, and wrap up with some industrial uh, examples. I'm not going to go into any detail here and a reference list. So if people would like the reference list, please just uh, type it into the chat box or uh, just send an email um, to us or, or a request on the web. 
so in this example, um, this is actually a paper by Musso et al., and this is from Sepracor, Inc., in Marlborough, in Massachusetts. So the title of this paper was Crystallization Improvements of a Diastereomeric Kinetic Resolution Through Understanding of Secondary uh, Nucleation. This actually featured in a previous webinar that I've done, Improving Crystallization and Precipitation part two, I think, which is available on demand if people are interested. And in that webinar, I, I kind of take the key points from this paper and kind of outline them. But the paper itself is also uh, obviously very good. But in this case, they looked at how agitation and seeding protocol impacted nucleation, and then how that subsequent transformation they were able to control, and how it improved the uh, enantiomeric uh, purity, the filterability of the process, and also the robustness. They reduced the number of failed batches that they had in the plant uh, significantly through the use um, of FBRM. These, uh, this reference list is just a, a snapshot of some of the industrial papers uh, available that are out there. This, I see some from GSK, from Sanofi, from Shearing Plough, from uh, uh, Sepracor, like I said, from Pfizer, um, AstraZeneca, there's a lot of BMS, there's a lot of different ones um, there. Feel free to jot these down or else just request this reference list uh, from us. But in all of these papers, essentially they've used FBRM for the purpose that I've described today. So they're linking the process parameters, the input properties to how the crystallization mechanisms behave and then linking that to the subsequent downstream product or pro process performance. And that really is the core uh, use of the FBRM technology in laboratory crystallization, and I hope I've uh, got that across today. So with that, uh, we'll finish up. Thank you very much. All right, so we've had some questions come in. Uh, we'll take some time to answer them. First question is, what if we don't want to seed for safety reasons? So this is a question we see a lot with uh, pharmaceutical APIs that are very toxic. It can often be the case that having people handling the seed material to seed a crystallization could possibly uh, cause some health problems. So one way to address this, for, a, for example, for a cooling crystallization would be to just simply cool your system until you have a nucleation event. And then from that point, heating up the system a little bit to dissolve the finest crystals first and then using the resulting slurry as your seed bed. And where FBRM comes in is to monitor the dimension of that seed bed so that you can get the same seed bed every time by cooling till you have nucleation, detecting that nucleation event, and then cooling so that your distribution, which is basically a fingerprint of the crystal dimension in the slurry, making sure that that ends up being the same from run to run, from batch to batch, so that you can then do your cooling from that point and get the same, you could basically get the same kinetics from batch to batch. So that way you could, in the spirit of this webinar, try different temperatures to heat the slurry to in order to see how the seabed grows after you've nucleated it and uh, heated it up again. Next question is, is PVM needed to detect if there's attrition? I would say typically no. Uh, in this webinar, there was an example where we saw the oiling out event as a result of uh, excessive supersaturation. In the example where we saw attrition with the, with the milling, example, we're pretty sure that the milling isn't going to create a oiling out event, but the PVM is handy for definitively knowing what's going on. So you get the certainty from the PVM images. It's very hard to argue with PVM images. On the other hand, the cord link distribution does give a very good indication of when you're generating fine counts during any process. The FBRM is very sensitive to fine particles or fine droplets. So when you see that first increase, it's very, it's very clear in the FBRM data. But for that absolute certainty of whether it's droplets or whether it's particles, that's where the PVM really comes in and, and helps. Um, another question 
does the color of the solution matter for the FBRM? When it comes to color, it really relates to what the index of refraction is. So if the index of refraction of the solution relative to the particle is very similar, then that can create problems because the the index of refraction of the solution and the particle need to be different so that light will scatter off of the crystals in the slurry. If they're very similar, then the light will just keep going and not backscatter back into the probe. So in that case, if the color is related to index of refraction, you just want the index of refraction to be different between the solution phase between the uh, mother liquor and the crystal. So at this point, uh, I'd like to thank you for your participation. Um, there's far more webinars on our website, uh, www.mt.com slash ac-webinars, where many different webinars are on demand. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, wish you a, a good day and uh, hope all goes well. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.